guys ready? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you. All right, it's 10 a.m. and we have a full agenda, so I thought we uh, should go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Gordon Everett. I'm the director of uh, customer relationship management for the uh, National Archives Federal Record Center program. We uh, would like to welcome and uh, thank you for coming to the bi-monthly uh, bridge meeting. This, uh, this is April uh, and not August. It'll be 85 degrees a day, so it'll be a nice day uh, for a change here in Washington. Uh, following this session, appraisal teams two and four uh, will meet at one o'clock in the Washington room. Uh, so you'll have uh, the appraisal team folks there, some of your account management, uh, uh, account managers uh, who represent those teams will also be available uh, for you to uh, uh, meet in those rooms. As usual, we'll be uh, following this meeting uh, on YouTube. And for our folks who are coming in online, uh, please be sure to uh, answer, ask your questions online, and we'll be sure to capture those uh, and try to get those answered as we go through uh, the program. And you can do your chat via YouTube or email, rm.communications at nara.gov. So as I told you, we have a, a full agenda this morning, uh, and we're going to get started. Uh, I think on the phone we'll have uh, Cindy Smolovic, Supervisor for Records Management and Oversight, reporting team, and she will update on records management reporting. Uh, Ann Cummings, who is our executive for research services, uh, will come to, through and introduce herself and talk about the mission of research services. We have Kate Russ, our national coordinator for the annual move, and she will discuss a recent memo and communications regarding the 2016 and 2017 annual moves. Gary Wouchfuss, who is the director of uh, records management training, he's going to discuss new records management course, which is available starting in May, uh, and also talk about uh, the enabling of credit card payments in the NARA Learning Center. And of course, a uh, 2018 records management course schedule. Uh, I'll give you a little update from the Federal Records Center program uh, on several uh, uh, initiatives. And then we'll end the morning with Jennifer Klein and Hannah Bergman uh, from the uh, Office of General Counsel at uh, National Archives. And they'll discuss recently updated and released records management contract language. So we'll start with uh, Cindy. Uh, do we have Cindy on the phone? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes. And I'm going to work your slides for you, Cindy. Um, I'm going to share my screen, and we're going she to see it. if that works. If okay. it doesn't, then um, I'll just tell you when to advance. All right. Well, good. Let's see if this works. Okay. I'm sharing a screen, and I hope you all can see it. Good. Um, right now, I'm showing the... Um, annual federal records management uh, reporting slide. Um, but it looks like all you're seeing is me. So there we go. Um, OK, um, I'm going to be on uh, the next slide, which um, this, there you go. You have that one. There's a little bit of a delay. So um, hopefully I won't get too far ahead of folks and the slides in the room. Um, good morning to everybody. As most of you know, I am uh, the lead team member for the annual reporting and uh, that we ask everybody to do every year. And it's a pleasure to talk to you. I'm uh, here in Fort Worth, Texas. And don't think the slides are working. Um, if you'll advance to slide number two. Go ahead, Cindy. Yeah, come on. Okay. Hey, Cindy, if you're looking at the uh, YouTube stream, don't do that. Just go ahead and I'll advance the slides for you. Anyway, on my screen, that slide is a lot prettier. It's um, got a little graphic that you can't see. But 
Um, in case you're wondering why we ask you to go through this every year, it's because NARA is required. to be able to respond to media requests and public interest groups, as well as citizens who have an interest in uh, records management and what we are doing uh, in the National Archives. So the only way we can accurately, accurately do this is uh, with your help uh, so that uh, we can provide information in a uniform way and we ask the same questions to all of uh, the records officers or their designee in, in much uh, detail as we can. So this, this uh, definitely helps us uh, get some uniform information. So advance to slide three, please. Sometimes uh, we need to get information on specific issues, um, as well as all the usual questions that we ask every year. For reporting in 2016, we split the reporting into three different vehicles. Uh, we um, had the SAO records for records management reports, the email management reports, and the RMSA. And there are differences uh, between each of these. Uh, the senior agency official reports are designed to look at, um, from a strategic point of view, from a higher level uh, management point of view. And this year it focused, as it has in the past, on the goals for the Managing Government Records Directive, uh, M 1218, particularly with email management, permanent records management, and the records scheduling goals. It also introduced some of the records management alignment that came out with uh, OMB Circular A130 and a little bit about if and what agencies are planning for the conversion of permanent records uh, that were not created electronically in the first place. All right. All right. All right. Uh, slide four. Okay. Or we can go just without the slides. Okay. For um, each of these reports, they're a little bit different. Um, for the senior agency official, uh, as I mentioned, we were concentrating mostly on um, what the uh, goals are for the directive. And then we focused on, for email, the success criteria that NARA put out last year. And then for the records management self-assessment, it's the usual uh, one that we've, um, you know, same questions that we ask every year. So if you go to the next slide, please. We get um, a lot of questions on uh, why do the questions change uh, periodically? Uh, why do they move around and that sort of thing? So for the records management self-assessment, they really haven't changed uh, very much since 2012. What we've done is um, move things around. We tweak the questions because we do listen to you. We get a lots of feedback on the understandability of the questions and whether or not they made sense or if uh, some of the wording was confusing, we will add some explanation or change the wording of the question. But for the most part, the scored questions, the intent of what we're asking stays the same. We do add different follow-up questions and take some out um, as things change in the government where new laws are passed, different guidance or policies have come out and it changes uh, what we need to find out or how we need to follow up on a question. When we add questions like that, it does move some of the questions that are scored, their numbering would change. We also have some questions that only ask, we only ask every other year. Uh, these are usually right around the storage questions, or we may ask some questions just once and they never appear again. And this too affects the order of the questions. For the SAO RM reports, uh, these changed this year specifically because of the December 31st, 2016 goals actually were here. 
And so instead of asking for progress on email management and the records scheduling goal, we were actually changed the question to say, did you meet these goals? And then we did continue with the permanent records goal question on progress. And we added some new questions that are basically for timely information. Like this year we asked about progress or changes that you've made to your program based on OMB A130. And last, the last time uh, we asked about the transition uh, plans that were being made for the upcoming change in administration. So for that report, that's why those changed, that we're trying to find things uh, that are a little more timely. The email management, if we do this again, uh, this was the maturity model and it should not change. Uh, if we run it again, and I anticipate uh, that we will. And so you'll be able to compare from what you answered this year to any uh, additional changes you've made or another steps that you've made along the maturity model line uh, for next year. And so you'd be able to watch uh, your maturity grow and we'd be able to make some comparisons from this year to, uh, to next year. Now, we try to have a single focus um, to bring all of these various information that we're asking you for, put it all together. There's a lot of times a central theme. And of course, this year, it's all about email. So what we do with the layered data on me email that we're getting, we look at what the senior agency officials uh, reported on electronic records management, whether they're making progress toward the goal, have already met the goal that has just passed, or uh, other information on different tools that are being used and so forth. And so that's where we bring in that level of report. For the email management, this was basically measured against the success criteria that NAR put out last year. And it was a way for us to say, yes, you've met the goal or you're working towards the goal that was reported in the SAORM report, but this is how effective you're being, how the success uh, you're having based on the criteria that we put out. And then for the RMSA, we do add some other specific aspects to email management that are based on the regulations um, and other requirements that are out there for email management. And we put all of this together so that we can get an overall picture and report on that as needed. So now let's, let's look at how we did this year about getting the reports in. And as of this morning, uh, we're at 85% of the SAO uh, reports are in, and there are still some that are coming in late. Uh, there's um, a lot of need for approval uh, from upper management and from other things that have delayed some of these getting in. And so we do expect to get uh, the rest of them in, hopefully by the end of this week. For email management, we're at 97%, and for the RMSA, we're at 98%. So we're still waiting on a few that are... Uh, still getting the information or getting approvals to submit the information to us. So I uh, just want to thank everybody who's already turned in uh, their reports. We know this is not an easy thing to ask of you every year, and we really appreciate you getting the information to us. And uh, another reminder is that this Friday, uh, the 14th, is the absolute last day. The survey it tool will close itself at 11.59 p.m., on Friday. So you have until then, uh, those of you that haven't got your reports into the tool yet to, to go ahead and do that for us. Okay, for a little bit of, on the numbers, if you're interested in a little sneak peek here, um, some of these will change just slightly as we get the rest of the reports in. But uh, from what you, you can see here, um, most of the uh, agencies are reporting some positive results. Uh, the majority of agencies um, have met uh, the email goal. And for the ones that said no, a lot of them were in progress um, and are waiting on capstone approval or some other small things. So um, if you're wondering why the number last year was we were expecting about 90% to um, have met this goal, and now we're looking at 72%. If you look at the ones that did say no, there, there's a lot of really good work going on out there. So we don't look at this as, as a negative um, result at all. Uh, the same thing for the retention scheduling. 67% uh, are saying that they met the goal by uh, the end of last year. 
And the others, um, again, most of them reported they're in progress. So we're not seeing anything that uh, they just say they're not going to do this at all. It's just that they are waiting for um, some final approvals and, and things like that. Uh, lots of progress still being reported on the 2019 goal. Uh, we also asked whether or not agencies had any plans uh, to digitize records that um, didn't start out electronically. And um, most of the agencies says that they've, they've either looked at this and decided that they are going to do something and gave us some descriptions of what they were going to do. Uh, some have already been doing some digitizing and others have found that the cost was just not uh, something that they wanted to do at this time. So that's good information for us to know. Uh, the last question that we asked was on the changes in records management and getting records management built into information resource management and the IT community. And so therefore that really helps us a lot for uh, knowing that 94% of those reporting are, are building records management into the information resource management. Okay, the next slide. Uh, this is a, a little bit of a look on where the maturity models have fallen out. Now, this data is a little bit old. It's from last week. Uh, we've got more reports that have come in, but I don't expect these numbers to change a whole lot. As you can see, um, most everybody is in the moderate to uh, low risk ranges, and a few have reported uh, being in the, in the high risk group. So yeah, the, the next slide, this is a uh, slide should look very familiar. We've been using it uh, for quite a while now. This is our RMSA trends slide. Uh, this slide is uh, showing you that since 2009, when we started the RMSA to now, there's been quite a bit of improvement and moving out of the high risk and into the moderate risk. Moderate risk stays pretty steady because you have people moving uh, up from high risk into moderate risk. And then those that started in moderate risk have moved up into the high risk, I mean the low risk, sorry, the low risk area. The interesting thing about this slide is if you look at 2010 and the green line was only at 5%. And this year, if you look at the red line, the red line is at 10%. So we have had quite a bit of movement, which is uh, really nice. That's doing that. Okay. The next slide. Okay. <laughs> Having technology issues, of course. Sorry about that. Can't get that to go away. Okay, we'll just go to the next slide, if you will. I think my screen is frozen. going to try this again. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Well, the next slide is basically um, telling you what uh, we are going to do with some of these reports. Uh, we've posted the SAO RM and the email management reports on the archives.gov website. We will uh, summarize the data and the reports as we get them in. And in order to um, do some of the summaries, we do uh, read all these reports. Um, so if you think that you're just send it, submitting them to us and nobody's reading them, uh, that's not true. Um, I have personally uh, so far read all the SAO reports that have come in and will uh, be um, looking at the comment boxes and so forth uh, that you've provided in the email and in the RMSA reports. So we actually do read these and uh, we appreciate all the comments that people do uh, take the time to provide us. Um, we also um, will be, for the RMSA, we will be doing some of the validation and further gathering of information by selecting random agencies uh, to talk to. And this gives us a lot more information than we can get from the yes, no questions that are on the RMSA. So we really appreciate uh, any of you that we uh, are selecting. Uh, if we do notify you, uh, we really appreciate your participation. Uh, so that's um, 
enough about us on uh, what we uh, are doing with your reports and a little bit on what you should be doing with this data. We want you to use your own scores, uh, set some improvement goals and measure some, your own progress. Uh, brief others on what you're doing and what your achievements have been. Uh, don't forget the good stuff. Uh, tell people that um, even if you started out with a lower score than you liked a couple of years ago, show people how you've improved your scores. Uh, if you have some of the still high risk areas, this is an opportunity to say that you need some help or that you need some resources. And if you uh, need help from the National Archives, we do have an agency assistance team, both in the Office of the Chief Records Officer and in the Federal Records uh, Center program. So it's a good opportunity to, to reach out um, to get some help there. We also think you should compare your scores, not only with yourself from year to year, but look at some of the other reports that are online, uh, particularly with the email and the SAO reports. Um, and also when we do our summary report for the RMSA, it has everybody's scores. See who uh, has some interesting things, things that uh, you might be able to leverage or that you're doing yourself. We also encourage you to do what you're doing now. You're taking part in Bridge and also hopefully in the Fron later. It's a great way to compare uh, how you're scoring on your annual reports with what other people are doing and get a good community together to, to help each other. So the next slide. Uh, what's next for us is that we will uh, finish analyzing the data. Uh, we will produce our summary reports for OMB and Congress, and then we get to start it all over again uh, to get started for next year. And the last slide, uh, this is it for me. Uh, if you have any questions on reporting or other oversight activities, uh, be sure to contact Don, uh, myself, or Evangela, and we'd be happy to talk to you. That's it for me. Hello. Thank you, Cindy. So just for everybody's benefit here, you see we're experimenting with some new technologies, trying to figure out how we can allow remote presenters to do a better job with what they're doing. Cindy was brave enough to volunteer this morning. And as you can see, when you do it live, it, it's never the same as when you do it in practice. So I appreciate everybody's patience. And we're going to keep working on this until you know, we get it down so good that people who are presenting remotely are just as good as people here in the theater. So once again, thank you very much, and thanks to Cindy. She, I think she did a great job, you know, based on the problems we were having with a little bit of the technology. Okay. Thanks again, Cindy. Next we'll have, uh, is Ann Cummings here? Yeah. Ann Cummings, our executive for research services. Uh, we'll come up now. Hey, Ann. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. I'm Ann Cummings. I am the new executive for research services. Although I am not new to the National Archives, I have been with this agency for 25 plus years. Um, throughout my tenure here at the National Archives, I have held different positions in a variety of offices across the agency, but I am very um, pleased and excited to be continuing my work in research services as the executive. Um, as you may or may not know, um, research Services is the organization within the National Archives that is responsible for preserving and maintaining per the permanent records of the federal executive agencies and the federal courts. As part of our maintenance of those records, we provide access services. For federal agency records management staff, this means that we work with you and your staff to accession permanent records into our holdings and provide any follow-on access um, to that you may require once you have transferred your records to us. So with this in mind, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce you to staff and research services that are key to our work with you and um, are just good contacts for you to know. 
I mean, please, I have some in the audience. I apologize for the you that are online. You can't see them, but you will have their contact information. And um, others, I, the others could not be here today. If you have questions about the, your um, holdings, that are accession holdings in the Washington, D.C. area for textual records, um, Aaron Townsend is the director for textual, um, textual records in the Washington, D.C. area. Area Aaron is here. Um, if you have questions for textual accessioning across research services, Tim Ennis is a good contact point to begin with. Tim is here also. Um, if you have um, questions about how to accession um, special media or concerns about special media records in your holdings, permanent holdings, please reach out to Deborah Lelansky. Um, if you have ac questions about s electronic records, how to um, accession different types of formats, or questions about formats that you have, or the all-important email, Ted Hull is um, the, per the director of electronic records. Please reach out to him. Also, if you have questions about um, access restrictions on records that you're planning on transferring or you know that you have transferred on or you, you're transferring records and you have FOIA requests for them or you want to know how to handle for your FOIA requests after you have um, accession the records or transferred the records to us, please reach out to Martha Murphy. She is the director of our access and FOIA branch at, um, in research services. In addition to um, the two facilities, archival facilities in the Washington, D.C. area, we also have 12 archival units across the country that ha hold and accession archival records from federal agencies. So if you want to have, inf you want information about um, archival records that are transferred in to St. Louis, Kansas City, Fort Worth, Denver, and Chicago, Brian McGraw is the contact point for that. If you have questions about archival holdings um, or you want to find out about the status of records being transferred to the archival facilities in Atlanta, Boston, Philadelphia, and New York, as well as Seattle, San Bruno, and Riverside, please contact Michael Moore. I want to thank you for this opportunity to introduce myself this morning. While the National Archives has a wide variety of customers, federal agencies and the courts are our most important. I look forward to working with each of you in my new role, so please feel free to reach out to me with any of your question, questions and concerns. You can reach me at annan.cummings at nara.gov. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ann. Next, we will have Kate Russ, who's the national coordinator for the annual move, and she will discuss the recent memo and communications regarding the 2016 and 2017 annual moves. Kate. Good morning, and hi to everyone on the stream. So he gave me an introduction already, but I'm Kate Russ, I'm the national coordinator for the annual move. I am also not new to NARA, but like Anne, I just came into this position. For those of you who might be unfamiliar with the annual move, it is a yearly activity spanning from the start of, of one move 15 months, where agencies in NARA work together to transfer physical and legal custody of records stored at federal record centers to the National Archives. In other words, the records become the property of the um, citizens of the United States and are accessioned into NARA's holding and available for any researchers. At any given point in any year, there are three annual moves occurring. So right now we've got three annual moves. 2016, for the, for the annual move 2016, agencies can still submit transfer requests until June 1st. For 2017, agencies can continue to, mit, to submit transfer requests until December 31st. And for both 2016 and 17, we are currently accessioning uh, records from federal record centers into the National Archives holdings. 
And then for 2018, right now, the National Archives is currently preparing what we call a candidate list. That's all the records that are eligible for disposition, meaning they can come into the National Archives for two, January 1st, 2018. We're preparing those lists. And they should go out to agencies in the sum, this summer. Um, and like I said, we call that the candidate list, but you just will know it as your records. There we go. So, as Gordon mentioned, we, I'm going to speak about some communications that you've received, and I've already see, received some emails back, like, we've been getting a lot about annual move. Yes, you have, and there's a good reason for it. So, on April 6th, we issued an AC memo. It was called Agency Action Needed on Draft Transfer Request in an ERI. This was a reminder that agencies have for the 2016 move until June 1st to submit transfer requests in draft form and in submitted for agency approval form after June 1st, those transfer requests are going to be deleted. Again, for 2017, you have until December 31st to submit them. We followed up this memo with some emails. So yesterday, some agencies received spreadsheets. It was 148 spreadsheets went out. Those spreadsheets were sent to agency records officers. Uh, they are anything that is in draft status for 2016 and 17. So you might be asking yourself, wait, I didn't receive that. If you didn't receive it, it might be because it went to your records officer or because you didn't have any transfer requests that were in draft status, so good for you. Um, and then finally, in May of this year, the Permanent Records Capture Team is going to follow up with some agencies. So again, it might not be all agencies, but we're going to target agencies that have the highest volume of records that are in draft status. So that doesn't necessarily mean the most transfer requests. It's not a one-to-one -one ratio. Some transfer requests might have a thousand cubic feet. So we're gonna look at the list of what's in ERA and make sure that we're hitting the agencies with the highest volume. So some deadlines, and I've already mentioned this twice, but I think repetition helps. 2016 annual move, you have until, agencies have until June 1st to submit them out of draft status. So that means your transfer official goes in and they push it to submit it for agency approval. Then your agency approval official goes in and submits them to NARA, proposes them. And then we go through our process at NARA. So again, little emoji, they get dumped if you don't submit them. For 2017, you have until December 31st. But it's better to do it now than later. If you're already in our ERA submitting for 2016, why not go ahead and do 2017? It's, it's a process, but you have a couple months to do it. So annual move by the numbers. We love numbers here. I saw Cindy's presentation and it warmed my heart. So for 2016, now again, these numbers change daily. So they might be a little off. I did this presentation a couple weeks ago. Um, we created in 2016 over 12,000 transfer requests. Agencies proposed probably at this point up to 8,000. We've got about 4,000 left in draft form. Again, these transfer requests are going to be deleted. Um, it just keeps our data current in ERA, especially as agencies submit new schedules. There's a reason we do this deletion of frees up some space. Um, so I encourage you to go in and submit your draft transfer requests. In 2017, we created, NAR created over 8,000 transfer requests. At this point, we're probably almost up to 5,000, which is awesome. So it's got about 3,000 to go. And again, you have until December 31st to submit them. That doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be moved this year, but if you submit them, propose them to the National Archives, they may have be potentially in included in future moves. So that might be 2018, 19, depending on the records. So I wanted to circle that. Those are the ones that are gonna be deleted, so please go into ERA if you have a chance. So why do we do this? I know you're all busy people. I have worked in a agency records off management office. I know how this goes. I know that there are a ton of competing priorities. However, there are a couple reasons that you should work on the annual move periodically throughout the year. The first is that the records, once records are accepted to the National Archives, they become the property of the people of the United States. So therefore, they are, they become available to researchers. This is important. This is the mission not only of our agency, but as federal employees, you work for the American people. So we encourage you to get this stuff to the archives as soon as you can so it's available for the people you work for. Second, it keeps the data current in ERA. Again, you're all working hard on redoing schedules, maybe big bucket schedules. That means the dispositions are changing, disposition authorities are changing. We delete the data out so that we can keep it current. Every 
if you lose, lose, if things are deleted out of ERA, they'll come back in five years. We do what we call five-year sweep. So anything that was eligible in 2016 will come up again in 2021. So you will have a chance to resubmit these, but why wait, do it now. And then finally, it saves money. I can't emphasize that enough. You can consult your agency disposition profile. So on, May th or on March 31st, agencies receive their disposition profile, um, which gives agencies the cost estimates for storage and transfer of records, which are past due for accessioning. In the example on my slide, and I don't remember what agency this is, but it's an old one, so it's not current data. This agency on the slide had over 5,000 cubic feet that was ready and past due for a disposition. If they, the agency had done a one-time transfer cost, it would have been about $30,000. Seems like a lot, however, if you look, the disposition profile gives you a cost estimate for the third year that they're still in storage, and the fifth year that they're still in storage, and then the tenth year that they're still in storage. By the fifth year, so when that five-year sweep happens again, the agency would have spent an additional $30,000 to store. So while I know it's hard to, especially in this era of tight budgets, to justify the expense, you're actually saving your agency. In this example, they would be saving the agency double what it would have cost to store them another five years. This is also the disposition profile is a great way to create buy-in if you're looking for a resource when talking to, say, your senior agency official, if you're not them, or someone else in, in management or budget. This is a great document to be able to take it and justify your position of why you should be doing these activities yearly. So some takeaways from my presentation. Log into ERA. If you are the transferring official, you are going to be able to submit anything that is in draft form to your agency approval official. The agency approval official is the person who can either, can probably submit in both draft and submitted for agency approval. Um, once that agency approval officer submits it or proposes it, it goes to NARA who will review it and decide if we're going to bring the records in. And for we, I suggest that you prioritize your 2016 draft transfer requests and then work on your 2017. You can see up on the screen there's a place for keyword. If you type in annual move 2016, you'll be able to bring up those first and then work on 2017. So that was really fast, but if you procrastinate now, you might panic later. So if you have any questions, please let me know. I've got some anticipated questions, but if not, we, our contact information is on the slide. It's annual.move at nara.gov. Also, if you have questions about ERA, say you forgot your login because you haven't logged in in so long, you can call the ERA help desk. You can also email them. They're wonderful. And if you're unsure of how to submit transfer requests in ERA, there is the ERA user guide. You'll get these slides. That's a hot link to be able to click it. However, you can go to era.nara.gov. The user guide's there. We also have wonderful resources on YouTube. If you type in National Archives Annual Move, you'll get a bunch of presentations which actually take you step by step in ERA on how to perform this action. So I highly suggest it. But otherwise, I'll take questions. And if no questions, enjoy the rest of Bridge. Thank you, Dave. Uh, to Kai, I'm Timely uh, from the Air Force. Okay. Uh, yes, I was one of those records officers who unfortunately got your humongous spreadsheet the yeah. other day. And the thing is that uh, when I was looking for the spreadsheet, um, and there are some things that popped out. Like one, uh, we do have a number of classified uh, permanent records in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And our Air Force declassification team, as great as they are, they can only do so much. Right. Uh, so what they usually do is they do a uh, permanent withdrawal of the boxes of classified material from the Federal Record Centers. And then they work with the um, OPR or the successor that, you know, hey, I can't let this go. Can we start uh, doing our work? And then later on, they do a um, direct offer. Uh, so that's one reason why you're probably not seeing all of our permanent records. In other cases, for the unclassified side, um, I have to reach out to my command records managers to uh, work with their various bases and other uh, offices that, you know, hey, um, do you want to relinquish control of these records? And so that can be a very lengthy progress um, in uh, trying to get those records to your um, uh, team. So it's just not that we don't know how to use ERA or we're just blowing off those uh, uh, requests. It's just that it's a very time-consuming process. And I just want that to be for your situational awareness. Yeah, and it's not as uh, uh, smooth as it uh, may appear to be. Yes, and I totally agree and understand okay. that. Like I said, I've been, I've been on the agency side. 
Um, and I'll just repeat, we know that there are some issues. Sometimes the records disposition doesn't match up to an agency's declassification review. So we're aware of those. We sent the spreadsheets out mainly just as a, hey, this is what's out there. Get us what you can. We know, again, there's a competing competing priorities. Also, I want to kind of champion the candidate list. So I'll go back a couple slides. Sorry for so much animation, but I thought it'd kind of help everything pop. So, like I said, in this summer, agencies are going to be getting what we call a candidate list. That is a list of all the records that are going to be eligible either for 2018 or anything that goes back in those five-year sweeps. So you got your 2013s, etc. When agencies get that candidate list, if you have the time, the goal of getting that to you early is so, like Mr. Lee said, you can send it out to your program offices, get them to the people who actually have the records, the, the I guess, subject matter experts, the people who created the records or their predecessors, to say, is this something that's actually eligible or do we need to hang on to it longer? Um, in the cases of the D-class review, that's just going to happen when it's going to happen when your agency has the resources. But when that's a couple months in the, from, say, July or August until NARA loads the TRs in ERA for the agency to do some work ahead of time so that you're not running up to the deadline being like, oh, i got to get this out to program offices. It's one of those where if you get it too early, send it out to the people who need to see it. Get the feedback. A lot of the times they'll be like, nope, we got to keep this longer. Or you know what? That's actually temporary. It was just someone in 1978 put it in there wrong. So that's one of the reasons we do those candidate lists. But thank you for your comments. We appreciate it. And we know that's going on in the agencies. And we're just trying to bump up the TRs each year, just get a little bit more. But obviously, you can only do so much. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you for your time. And again, annual.move at nara.gov. Oh, one more. Okay. Hi, good morning, everyone. <laughs> Can you, okay. I'm Maurice King. I'm Navy Records Officer. Just one quick question. Um, going forward, when it comes to the ERA, uh, any um, plans to do any upgrades to make it a bit more user-friendly, give us some added capability and so on? I'm not the ERA person, so I can't answer that question, um, but I'm... Maybe Lawrence can? I'll pass it to the boss. <laughs> happy, to, happy to take you off the hook. I was hoping to just sit in the front row and look pretty. Um, so, the, so the question is, we are working on ERA, um, ERA 2.0. We're working on pilots, uh, research, working on processing. Um, and we will get to a point where we'll, we'll have something for you. I don't know if there's anything more specific we can say. Uh, we're hoping to do pilots in FY18. Um, so uh, we are we are working very closely with um, our partners internally, um, developing the research. Um, we will engage with agencies, um, like I said, in FY18, um, and we will have some communications. We always have, every now and then we have briefings here at Bridge where we talk about what we're doing. We bring in some of the experts to talk about, uh, you know, new developments with ERA. So there'll, there'll be a lot more to talk about. We'll see if we can get more briefings in at the next bridge or maybe a subsequent bridge um, just to give you an update on where we are, what the developments are. But just want to assure you all, I mean, this is something that's critical to our mission. Um, it is essential that we solve the problem and provide a service that um, for all agencies meets your needs and our needs and expectations so that we can transfer the permanent records in. So Kate's talking about the annual move. So, you know, we're focused there with, with textual records and paper records coming out of the record centers, but, you know, as we go more electronic, I mean, we have to have a way of getting records in. So at this point, um, Ann put up the, the contact information for e-transfers at nara.gov. If you have questions about how to transfer electronic records in, you can go to e-transfers at nara.gov and uh, talk to an accessioning archivist. You can talk to Ted Hull, and they will help you get electronic records in. 
Right now with ERA, as you know and you're aware, we use it for the annual move, we use it for developing record schedules, we use it for transfer requests. So there's functionality there that helps with the, with the transactions and the processing of the, the business objects and the tools that we have for, for doing records management. So we are right now working on the research that um, focuses on the repository, that focuses on the processing tool and the, the digital processing environment. Um, and we are going to be doing some work around the business objects and you know, looking at the record schedule and the transfer request. All this is gonna come together. Um, and we expect, as I said, in FY18 to really start engaging with agencies on piloting and testing. Um, so up until that point, we want to, before we get into FY18, we'll, we'll continue to do updates and communications with all of you. Um, through our blog and through our other emails that we send out so that you all know what is going on with ERA. But it's definitely a work in progress. We're committed to making it successful, um, and we certainly expect that it will be. Thank you. Do we have any more questions for Kate before we move on? All right, thank you, Kate. I'll turn it back over to Gordon. Okay, uh, next up, uh, we'll get information on the uh, new records management course that will start in uh, May of 2017, and more information on the uh, course schedule from 2018 uh, from the Director of Records Management Training, Gary Rauchman. Good morning, everybody. Great to see you again. And uh, looking forward to sharing some information for you. I'm going to go pretty quickly on some of this. Um, since it won't be earth shattering, but some good news. So what I wanted to start today with was that we will in a few weeks be able to let you pay by credit card automatically in our learning management system. Um, for most of you in the room, maybe that's not a big deal. You're done with your courses. Um, but for your folks that are still coming to training, that should ease the burden of how they're enrolling. Uh, they will still have the option of sending a payment another way. So if their, their credit card holder isn't available or they just don't want to go through paying online, if they still choose send bill in our payment options, they'll get an email with a form to fill out, fax the form and the credit card information to us, or fax the form and then call the credit card information, we'll stay take it that way. But quite frankly, it's a lot easier just to go through and be at Amazon. And let's check out, you'll put your information in, uh, in terms of the credit card holders, often they're worried about what's happening with my data. We are storing none of it. So you'll put the data into our LMS. The transaction is passed from our system over to Treasury through pay.gov. We get a return with the transaction ID from that system, and that's it. The data essentially is gone out of our system. So the person doing it will get the confirmation screen saying, okay, let me make sure I place my order. It's done. And even better news for the folks coming to training, as opposed to waiting days, wondering whether or not this payment got processed and what's going on with the credit card payer sending stuff to us, the transaction happens immediately. So that student can now go back into their account and see that instead of having a, sta a status that says pending payment, they are registered, good to go for that particular training. So a lot of, a lot of improvement there, both from usability for you and for the person coming to training, you know that everything's ready to go. There's no question about their status getting into training. The other piece of this is the person that's taking the training will get an automated message from the system saying, yes, we've received your payment. That is the receipt for the credit card holder. Okay, so they need to send that back to that person or coordinate with it. We can still pull that action back up in pay.gov if there's some receipt we need to track down for you. Um, but ideally, this also stops the problem that we see a lot where credit card holder did not get a receipt or there was a communication problem, particularly there, sometimes among people. So hopefully this will speed up things for the, both of the folks with that also. Um, as Gordon mentioned, we are getting ready to launch a new course. Um, so in May, folks will be able to uh, enroll in fact, I think I set it up yesterday, so you might be able to go in and enroll already. Um, June will be the first time we offer this. So I wanted to step you through. It's a little bit different format than anything we've done before. The course is 100% online, completely asynchronous, so there's no scheduled time for anything to occur. Everything will be done independently. We do have instructors involved in this still, 
but there's not a set meeting time. So the folks will get enrolled in a cohort of the Sustainable Formats and Permanent Electronics course, Records course. Again, the course is to help you think about preparing those records that are permanent in electronic format that are eventually going to come to us. Right? So we'll look at what are the formats that are acceptable in electronic records to come to us. How can you potentially deal with the factors of migrating those formats over time? What are your things to think about? as well as work through the transfer process for those permanent electronic records. All the course materials will be right there for you. It's divided into four weeks. Each week, you'll have an online set of lessons you'll do, some postings in a discussion area, and then a reflection activity. Um, the reflection activity and the postings, our instructors will monitor, make sure folks are doing what they need to do, and that's our way of saying, okay, does somebody are they engaged enough in learning that we can give them course credit at the end of all of this, right? So again, our lessons are all set up to be completely self-paced. Um, so they're all in there where you can step through as you want, go back and forth. Uh, we've used a lot of video in this course where we've brought in experts that are the, the person at the archives that knows this particular area the best, did some interviews with them to give you that information that way rather than just put a bunch of text on the screen. And each week, you'll come into our discussion area, uh, respond to some, some threads that we've put there that prompt you to think about what should I have learned this week, um, as well as interact with the other folks in the course. So it, we're running um, another pilot this month right now for our instructors as part of their training, some of our staff internally. Um, and it's interesting to see some of the other comments that are cropping up too. So this also becomes a great way to build community from folks from different agencies uh, that hopefully will potentially carry on after the course. Um, so we're planning to offer this through June, July, and September. Again, the course is offered over a month period. So you'll enroll, the course will start usually the first Monday of that month and run through roughly the last Friday. Each week, the assignments are due at five o'clock Eastern at the end of that week. Um, so our instructors can then go in and make sure that they're tracking everything. Um, and in the learning management system, if you just go in in the top right corner, search for sustainable, it'll pop up that enrollment. Um, initially, you're going to see, okay, how do I get to the course? The folks that do take this, they're not going to be able to get into the course until the day it starts. So it'll pop on their transcript a few days before, and they'll, they'll see in the action button that says none till the actual start date of the course. We've set that to midnight the first day of the course. So you come to work Monday morning at 6 a.m., that none button should have changed to a launch, should be ready to go. Um, and similar to our other online courses, we're, we're doing this at $125 per student right now, and we'll, we'll see how that plays out over time to see what the costs and uh, our uh, cost to run it versus the revenue that we're bringing in from people taking it. Again, the main goal here, though, is really support your thinking about what am I doing for 2019? Because as we start to worry about what are we doing with those electronic records a little bit more, the permanent ones, this will give you the information that your folks need to decide how to do migration of formats, what formats are acceptable or not, and then start thinking through what's the transfer process going to be when we want to hand these records off to the National Archives. Um, a little bit for this year, I wanted to, to talk a little bit where we are in the country. It's been a strange budget year for all of you. We recognize that. We're seeing it on our end. Um, so a lot of our field locations, we've not been seeing great numbers of enrollments. Certainly understand that it's a tough environment right now, but just a reminder, these are the places around the country that are still available for folks to get training from us if they're not here in the D.C. area. And we're also going to make a major change in 18 about how we think about doing training in the field. So one of our challenges has been guessing where you have people that need training. And then trying to balance that against what we get throughout the year with requests coming in from, I really do have a group of people in this place and you aren't offering training there. And we've kind of already allocated all our resources maybe for that period of time. So trying to juggle that and provide you the best support has been, been difficult last summer. And we're seeing a little bit of that even with some of our cancellations this year. So next year we've decided to limit what we're gonna initially offer in the field. Doesn't mean you can't get courses and we'll talk through what that's gonna look in a minute. Um, we're going to move our basic records operations and our vital business information course. We're only gonna offer them online unless you request a face-to-face -face class. We've seen that over the past couple of years. There's been a, a steady decline of people coming to those in person 
because they are already available online. Again, those courses are offered in a, a four-week period with one 90-minute webinar each week. So pretty easy to space that out, work it into an employee's workload and do it for remotely. Uh, and again, for all of this, you can request classes anytime. So again, going into next year, what we really want to do is say, how do we put our resources at the right place at the right time better than what we've done in trying to guess where sometimes people are available to take training? So I wanted to talk through what does that look like, right? How do I request training? What happens? Uh, so I put together a couple of stories based on things that occur all the time for us, and some of you probably have availed yourself of these. So if you're that agency records manager someplace around the country, you've got all these people that need training, or maybe you had an IG inspection and said, oh my gosh, we've got a problem with records management. What am I going to do about it? So you pick up the phone, call the National Archives, and you say, well, look, I've got all these people who need trained, but we don't have a travel budget. We can't get to you. We can't get to where any of your training is. What do we do? Well, the easy answer is, instead of you coming to us, we will come to you. So I can send my trainers to you if you've got a decent-sized group of people, right? All, all we've got to do is figure out the financial budget on our side to make the numbers work so that we're not losing money on it. Usually that number sits somewhere between 10 and 15. It depends on what training you're requesting. When you put a series of courses together, for example, if you've got a bunch of people that you want to get the certificate, when you put K through two through six together, I can do that at lower numbers. So that's my 10 side. If you're going to request a face-to-face -face basic records operations course, I probably need to be on the 15 side just to offset the travel costs of getting somebody to wherever those people are. So all that goes great. We, send, we coordinate the details with you. We'll sign a memorandum of understanding or agreement so we both understand what we're committing to. We send our trainer to you. to do. They do a great job with training. Your folks get their certificate for the course or the big one. You see records management improve. Your RMSA score gets better. And oh, by the way, your happy dance is going on because you've got less to worry about, right? So that's pretty good if you've got a good group of people. But what if you're in one of those situations where, hey, it's me and my buddy, and there's nobody else, right? There's no way we can get a trainer to come for two people. So what does that look like? Well, you go to the boss and you bug for travel money. But that never really works out for you, right? So you start talking around the office and you say, well, what can we do? So instead of getting on the phone, you send us an email and say, look, we really would like to have this course. In fact, we saw this a lot last year with the electronic records management course. Number of folks really wanted it, didn't have a big enough population. But guess what? We'll work out a deal with you. We can still probably come to you, but we're going to need some help. So you need to contact your buddies, get on that megaphone, get out the Rolodex, whatever you've got to do in your local area to think about who else could come to this training. We'll do some of that for you. We'll send out advertising flyers. We'll look at who do we know in that particular geographic region. We'll put the courses in our learning management system, hope that maybe there's other people that want to go to your hotspot, and hope that we can get enough people into that training to make it work. More often than not, we're pretty successful doing this, especially if you give us a three, four months ahead of time so that we can do the advertising on it, usually works pretty well. So we get a bunch of people from other places to come to your location with you. We send our trainer out, does a great job making sure that we're not doing unauthorized destruction anymore. Lo and behold, after the courses, everyone hits the books. They're going to get their great certificate of records management training if you're doing the whole KA series. Great story, right? So the good news story goes on. Your boss decides to talk about this in their executive management meeting, focusing on look at all the money that we didn't spend, right? Because you didn't waste all that travel money that you didn't have anyhow. And oh, by the way, you can talk about the benefit in terms of collaborating to, with other agencies and what's going on with them. That happened to result in spot awards for both the boss and the person that started all this, <laughs> which, you know, we went to and did a little shopping afterwards once we did it. So for all of those situations, or if you've got something even completely different, Michelle Bradley is the team supervisor that handles these for me. If you can't get a hold of her, feel free to reach out to me. If neither one of us get back to you pretty quickly, you can always email rmt2 at nara.gov. And our coordinator that handles the, the registrations for all of our field training 
will get that pointed in the right direction, either us or she'll answer you back directly. So story's over. What are your questions about anything in training that we've brought up? Yes, ma'am. I'll bring you a mic from one side or the other. Hey, Gary. Okay. We've got one question online. Go ahead, Tom. The new course, great question, Patty. So how long is somebody gonna invest in the Sustainable Formats course? We're anticipating it's about eight hours total. That's what we've seen in some of our early runs. And again, you know, individual can spend more or less how much they think about those discussion topics, how much they read, but that's what we're looking at has been the average so far. Yes, ma'am. For requesting the, um, a trainer to go out and do the training, we have a lot of field offices um, in our agency, and a lot, it was a lot of turnaround, a lot of people retired, a lot of people left the agency. So now we have new people um, that are now in those records management roles, but they never had any records management training. So if there is a region that has different offices in the state, in each state, um, would you all go out to train a region of employees that are new to records management? Absolutely, so if you're gonna bring those employees into one of your central facilities, great. If you've got a bunch of them in the different places, we can look at that option for you too. All right, so a number of ways we can do it. And the last one is, if they're really new and maybe you wanna start them with the basic records operations course, we can do that, set up a separate iteration for you online and we may not have to do that over the course of a month like we normally do. So we've done this with other customers where they say, I want that basic records operations course, but I really want to knock it out in a week. So let's do four 90 minute sessions Monday through Thursday, as opposed to one a week over time. So again, we can set those courses up for you online potentially that meet your needs in a different way also. So if you just reach out to us, give us the, the the individual need, what you're looking at with numbers and areas, we'll find out the best way to meet your need. Yep. Other questions? Um, Sir. Matt Staden with the VHA, Veterans Health Administration. Um, have you ever thought about taking KA two through six and making it a VTC? Um, we have 150 hospitals, 300 vet centers, and about another 300 branch clinics. So getting all those people into you is next to impossible. Even if you came to us, you'd only get a small portion of our total overall scope. Absolutely, I we've thought a lot about it. And I think what we're trying to do is, as we move to the new curriculum, which we're anticipating around fiscal year 19 should be rolling out, what we're doing with all of that is trying to design everything to be available both online and face-to-face -face then. Because of that effort, we've chosen to not really focus a lot of resources on converting the current KAs to an online version. Um, to be frank, just having one of our instructors lecture through a VTC is not the best learning experience for the people on the other end of it. And our courses really are pretty lecture heavy right now. And the activities are intense enough that sometimes it's hard to do them with one person at a distance also. So we'll look at individual situations where there's a need and try to see if there's something we can work with you. But I'll be frank telling you, I try to frown on doing too much of that right now because I'm not sure that we're providing you an effective learning experience that way. Whereas if we just design them for that environment down the road, then I'll be confident about the person on the other end of it is still getting the learning that they need from what they're experiencing. Anything else? Well, thank you for your time this morning. Again, if you have questions about training, reach out to me or Michelle and we'll be happy to answer them for you. Okay, I just have a couple of announcements, uh, three or four announcements and reminders um, for you this morning before we get into our last presentation. Uh, these are from the uh, Federal Records Center program. Uh, from time to time, uh, we have some customers who have to access non-publicly available records after hours. And some customers have some relationship with centers and know how to reach those centers. Well. We're going to uh, uh, put a procedure in place uh, for all customers where you can submit those requests, any emergency after hours request, 
uh, will must be submitted by the designated uh, agency records officer. Uh, that contact will be made at our offices uh, with the security office in College Park. And we're going to ask you to provide the name, telephone number, and the agency name, and the FRC location of those records, the description of the records, and the type of records that are being requested. And we're also going to ask you to be prepared to meet uh, the FRC personnel at that designated center. Now, these, again, are uh, usually emergency requests. We don't get them that frequently, but you may have them from time to time in the middle of the night. That may be necessary. Uh, you will get this email from your account managers. Uh, you're seeing this this morning, but uh, an email will come out this week from David Weinberg through the account managers. So if you don't want to have to write this down, we'll send this information out to you by the end of the week. Uh, this week. There is a, uh, a fee for this type of service, obviously, because it's, it's well after hours when it's done, and it's a, a $500 fee uh, to have to do this. But m a lot of folks don't use it, but it is there. It's a uh, uh, one effort in one place that we want to put in place so everyone can make sure that we handle this more efficiently uh, for after hours requests. Kind of a se second reminder. Uh, if you uh, remember, we put the, uh, uh, in February, the surcharges began for customers who did not uh, do their transactions on the Arcus customer portal, uh, specifically around uh, records transfers and uh, 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 reference request. Uh, this is more of a uh, public service announcement or a PSA, uh, just to remind you that uh, if you have not deployed uh, on the Arcus customer portal. Maybe you've chose, your agency has chose not to, and that's fine. Um, but if you would let your account manager, give your account manager names of uh, uh, two super administrators, we still can get folks up uh, on the portal. It, it's a, a great and efficient way uh, to handle transactions with the Federal Records Center program. Uh, so we encourage customers to do so. Um, but again, uh, this started in February, so many of you probably uh, we have about 80% of the customers on the portal, a little over 80%, and we thank you uh, for doing so. Uh, but the remainder of customers who would like to get on, um, just let your account manager know and we can get you there. Kate talked about this a little bit earlier. Last week, I think, or week before, week before last maybe, you should have received your uh, disposition profile uh, for your agency. The good news is that uh, we have fewer agencies who are encountering uh, past due disposals. That's the good news. Uh, uh, but we ask you to please review uh, the 13,000 ones that come across and provide a response on those on a timely basis um, so we can handle any dispositions that you have. There's still a concern on unscheduled records. We ask you to re review that also um, as there are still some agencies with some unscheduled records and we need to uh, uh, get those records scheduled. So if you haven't received your distribution, uh, disposition profile, please let us know today so we can make sure, let one of the account managers know, we can make sure this information gets to you. Before I take uh, questions, the last thing, uh, is Rashad here? Rashad's here, right? Rashad Shakur at the back of the room. Rashad is the, uh, our information security and CUI program manager. And uh, we're pleased to uh, announce, and you'll have more information coming out in the next few weeks. Uh, at the beginning of fiscal uh, F-18, the Federal Records Center uh, will be um, fully CUI, we'll have CUI capable facilities uh, across the country. Uh, we'll have multiple facilities that can handle basic CUI. We'll have some regional facilities that will be able to handle specified uh, CUI specific. So you'll hear more about that in the coming weeks. Uh, you'll see more of Rashad Secure, who is our security information person. Uh, but we wanted to let you know this service will become available. And you'll see more about it uh, at the beginning of the fiscal year in October 2000, this year, 17. Any questions on the Federal Record Center portion of this? We have one here. Hold on for the mic. Wait for the mic. We want other folks to hear you. Yeah, we do. We need folks online to hear you. 
Just, could you just, just tell us what CUI is again? Okay. Somebody pass. Rashad the mic. He's the, <laughs> the subject matter expert. Somebody give so we can get it right. Thank you. Um, I'm Rashad Shakir, the Information Security Program Manager and the CUI Program Manager for the Federal Record Center Program. Um, if you haven't heard about CUI yet, you will be pretty soon because CUI is uh, very sensitive information, but it's not classified information that the Information Security Oversight Office has promulgated a new implementing regulation for starting this year. So um, it's not classified information, but it's information that agencies want to protect because either a law or regulation or something along those lines tells them that they have to protect it differently than they do their unclassified information. So um, the Federal Record Center program, as a service to our customers, we want to let our customers know that we will be able to provide secure facility storage for those records if they, if they so desire. And we'll be um, bringing up our program probably the beginning of, this, of the next FY. So, Agencies out there, if you have CUI, you know you do, and if you need us to store it for you, we will be able to provide that service. Thank you. Any other questions around that? Thank you. Okay. Uh, if none, we'll go to uh, Jennifer Klein and Hannah Bergman from our general counsel's office. Are they here? They're here. And they're going to bring us... Uh, Recently updated information on records management contract language. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Hannah Bergman. I'm an attorney here at the National Archives um, in the Office of General Counsel. Um, I'm Jennifer Klein, also an attorney in our Office of General Counsel. And we have been working um, with um, Lawrence's team in the <coughs> Office of the Chief Records Officer, it seems like forever, possibly a, a year or so, um, on this project. So, um, so we noticed uh, quite a while ago that we had um, put out some language in 2007 um, that was part of the Records Management Handbook, and it addressed this, this issue of records management uh, and contracts and sort of what agency contracts should say about records management. And then we maybe not updated that for a decade. Um, <laughs> things change over time. Uh, and this sort of came to our attention when we did the automated electronic records management uh, report, which was part of the president's records management directive. And anyway. So we needed to update some really old language. Uh, so we've done that, which we're really excited about uh, because we like to be current with the law. Um, so this is a link uh, to that language, um, which you can click on. Um, I don't really know anything else about the rest of the records management handbook, but <laughs> this part we know is good. <laughs> um, and so this is what it looks like. It's a template um, language um, for you guys to use out um, for records officers to, to work with their um, acquisition offices um, and their offices of general counsels to use. Um, so why use it? So as you may have noticed, um, we issued um, the training bulletin, I think it's uh, 1701, um, and that sets forth uh, your, your requirements for training um, on records management for all federal employees, and then also talks about training for contractors. In addition, A130 was updated in the summer, I mean, it said sort of agencies have to provide records management training for federal employees and contractors. You aren't going to be able to comply with those requirements if you don't have um, language in each of your contracts that says the contractors need to take training on records management, right? Um, your Office of General Counsel and your acquisition folks are going to say, well, this isn't covered by the contract. They don't have to do that. How are you going to make them do that? You need to have language in place that sort of addresses this. So that's one of the sort of the primary things that this language um, will do. It also um, will make it clear what the contractor's obligations are with regard to handling of federal records, which is something we often get questions about and people sort of don't really understand. 
well, what is the federal record? Can it really be created by a contractor? What happens when a contractor has an agency email account? All those things, this language is meant to address. Um, and it's also flexible for, you, for your agency's needs. So it's a template that you can start from. You can change it as needed. Um, so really take a look at it, read through it, see if there are problems in it, um, things it does or doesn't do um, that you need to tweak a little bit. Um, right. And so I'm going to turn it over to Jen. So Hannah had touched on this a little bit, but in terms of when do you actually need to use this language, what contract should you be considering including this, this term and condition in? And um, our answer for that is any contract where there's a possibility of a contractor creating, working with, or otherwise handling federal records. So to us, that when for our NARA contracts, that's going to be all of our contracts. I mean, there's this is a very broad, broad language, and um, the possibility of whether or not contractors are going to be handling federal records is um, pretty broad reaching. Also, in terms of sort of the contractual standpoint, there's very little downside to including it in the contracts. Um, as Hannah said, it makes the contractors aware of what those obligations are, what their records management obligations are. Um, also makes the contracting officers aware of their records management obligations and how they have what their role may or may not be in interacting with the contractors in the records management process. Um, and in terms of the training obligations, the way the clause or the term and condition is constructed, the training obligations applies only to those contractor employees who are involved with the records. So um, you may have we've talked to a lot in looking at this con in terms of how we're deploying it with our contracts. Um, one of the contracts we looked at was janitorial contracts. We have janitorial contracts for a number of our facilities. Clearly not all of the contractor employees on those contracts are working with creating and handling federal records. That's fine. There's no reason not to include this term and condition in that contract regardless because some of those employees are. And the term, um, the part of the term and condition that applies to the training obligation only applies to those contractor employees who will be handling or who handle the federal records and have the possibility of handling federal records. So if there are people who don't, they would not be covered by the training obligations of the term and condition. And as Hannah mentioned, this you need something in your contracts in order to be able to enforce um, that training obligation on your contractors. And so this is, we think, the easiest and cleanest way to make sure that those contractors are aware of the obligation and then you as agencies can enforce that obligation on the contractors. Um, that's part of the reason this came up is we were looking at rolling out training for our contractors and realized we needed to ensure that all of our contracts had that, had that included already. Um, so how do you use the language? This language, um, when you click on the link, there's sort of some prefatory language that talks about um, how you as agencies can implement it. Uh, the main suggestion we have is working with your Office of General Counsel and your acquisitions departments to make sure that you're all on the same page and aware of this obligation um, and then see how it best fits into your contracts or your procurement vehicles. And the language is um, intended as a term and condition so um, it would go in if you have privacy terms and conditions, um, access terms and conditions specific to your facility or your agency in the contract, it would go along with those. Um, it's a model. So there are several spots you look at the, when you look at the term and condition where we have bracketed um, fill in your agency's name here. So those are the obvious areas where you can um, personalize it to your agency, but you should also feel free to tailor it as appropriate. And that's why we encourage you to work with your acquisitions and general counsel's office to see if there are specific things that you need addressed or wanted to address um, in a different way. The, the thing that this, this language does not do, and we want to be very clear, is that this will not and does not replace your records management requirements. So if you're procuring an IT um, or an information system and it needs records management requirements for the way the system works and the records management capability of the system, this term and condition does not speak to that. That still needs to be covered in your requirements section. Um, that's something you'll work with separately and establish exactly what you need the system to do. This term and condition looks to what the contractors do and what those contractor employees do. So this is separate from that requirement um, to include that records management um, language in the procurement of those systems. So just a high-level overview of some of the updates 
that um, are in this um, updated version, uh, an introduction, as I mentioned, on how to use the language. That's not something you'll include um, in the contract itself, but just for your use, your Office of General Counsel, your acquisition uh, divisions, for them to use an understanding um, how to use this term and condition. Uh, the definition of record is updated to comport with 44 U.S.C. 3301 definition, and we've expanded and fleshed out some of the requirements sections. We'll talk about a couple of those uh, here in a minute. And then also added a section to clarify that this requirement, uh, this term and condition applies to subcontractors as well as contractors for the contract. So I'll turn it over to Hannah to talk about a couple of the specific updates and changes to this contract. So applicability, um, we highlighted a couple of times, applies to all contractors whose employees create, work with, or otherwise handle federal records regardless of the medium in which the records exist. Um, so this language should also track with the training requirements um, and what we've said about training. So as Jen said, you only need to be trained if you're touching federal records, creating them, working with them, right? You don't need to be trained if you're um, never touching touching the records um, and the the language in the con in the term and condition is meant to um, be, be targeted to that um, and then of course we updated the definition of a federal record the 2007 version used the um, pre-2014 version of a federal record so we've updated that um, made sure that it's media neutral um, and then sort of uh, excluded the uh, relevant things, right? So it doesn't cover personal materials. Um, it may include deliverables and documents associated with those deliverables. So deliverables under a contract may be property of some sort, or it may be a record. Um, you, you may have prop property and then records about the property. Uh, the language is meant to address all those uh, particular situations. Um, and I think it also sort of makes clear that, for example, if um, you know you have, let's say, contractor support for a records management uh, program within your uh, agency, right? So maybe some of your staff are actual contractors. They've got agency email addresses. They're working with uh, program offices and answering questions about uh, transfer of records, disposal, that sort of thing. Those are federal records. They're just created by that contract employee. Um, and they reside in the agency system. But that, that contract employee needs to understand what those obligations are with regard to those records. So this, this language takes care of that issue. So we'll just um, touch on a couple of the items highlighted in the requirements section. The contractor, uh, the language requires the contractor to comply with all applicable records management laws, regulations, and NARA record policies, and it includes citations to those statutes and regulations in the, the NARA statutes and regulations that apply here. It um, also clearly states the contractor obligation in terms of preventing alienation or unauthorized destruction of records and provides um, a requirement, uh, notifies them of the requirement to notify an agency of inadvertent or unauthorized disclosure. And this is one of those areas where the term and condition could be tailored to your specific agency. Um, I think the way we have it structured, it just has a blank for your agency name. But if this makes more sense to include a con an office or a, a position to no be notified in the case of destruction or disclosure, um, that would be something that you could uh, tailor to make it a little more applicable to your agency. Uh, the term and condition also requires express approval for subcontractors. So the contractor or the contracting officer rather is aware of any subcontractors who may be creating, handling, or otherwise working with federal records. So they're also aware of the obligations that apply to them, and the contracting officer is avail aware of the possibility for that, um, for that, and the need for training for those subcontractor employees. Uh, the requirements also require that the um, a government IT equipment is used only for purposes tied to the contract. So it's not used by the contractor for contractor-specific non-agency, non-government business. And we also have language in here <clears throat> in the term and condition about the agency owning the right to all data records and deliverables produced as part of this contract. This, again, we want to highlight as a something that um, your agency may want to adjust um, or tailor, depending not just on your agency, but also on the specific contract. The federal acquisition regulations, which 
um, govern uh, our, our government contracts have several clauses, several options for clauses in terms of data rights. Um, who owns the data that's developed or produced under a contract, be it the government, the contractor, or some division of the two. The way that this term and condition is set up, the ownership of all those defaults to the government, um, the idea being that we then own it and we have the ability to manage those um, records as appropriate. But if this is um, a research and development contract or there's other considerations here, you're going to want to make sure you discuss that with your acquisitions team and see what the, what the best um, the best data rights clauses to include there. And the term and condition does reference the FAR data rights clauses, so you can see, um, see what makes the most sense there. But if it's not changed as it is, the default is for the agency to take ownership um, in everything produced under the contract. Right. And then um, we've talked a lot about who has to take the training, um, but one thing that you should keep in mind is now you actually need to have training that you give people to deliver, right? Um, so it's great. You can say you need to take training, but it, you've got to like provide that. So what we sort of envision happening is agency records officer gives agency acquisitions office the training, and then that is um, distributed to the contractors as the contracts are awarded, um, and then those vendors are responsible for making sure their employees get trained. You may have different processes in your agency for getting contractor employees trained. That's great. No problem. Just make sure you understand what those are and how your training is going to fit into that process, right? Um, so for example, um, LBMB is our, uh, the, the vendor here at this building that does all the you know, audio video support, um, the janitorial services, et cetera. We don't have contact with each of those employees, and those employees don't all have NAR email accounts, and they don't all have accounts on our NAR learning management system, right? So the best way for those folks to get trained when they need to get trained is for the core in the contract to, to give that to that vendor, and then the vendor itself to, to manage their employees um, as part of their, their process, right? Um, so that's how we logistically feel like it's easiest for us to do it. You may feel like it's different um, depending on your size and scope. Um, but we would really suggest making sure um, you know what training it is you want these people to take, um, and then you're able to deliver that to the acquisition office in some, some package, right? So maybe it's you've got it on the LMS system, your agency's LMS system, and that's how they take their annual training, but you also have a PDF that you're providing to the acquisitions office and then that's part of sort of a package that vendor gets on initial award, and then you can go from there. Um, this is, I think, similar to what happens with IT security and privacy training. So there's a FAR clause um, for privacy training related to contractors, so you may already have processes in place that relate to that, and you can leverage <laughs> those as well. All right, and then the flow down requirements to subcontractors. Um, it's pretty standard uh, language. Uh, any anytime the prime subs, those subs will be covered by these obligations, um, and we'll have to do all the things that the prime had to do. All right. So uh, questions about this? We put up the um, the a the email address that AC um, mans and can forward questions on to us uh, as they're needed. We're happy to talk to. Um, agency records officers, but also general counsels and acquisition offices about um, their thoughts or questions that they may have about the term and condition. Um, we would love to think about, uh, well, we'd love to get feedback on this language, right? Because we can improve it, certainly, and we don't need to wait 10 years before we update it again. So if there are, there's a critical mass of people that, that see language not working for them, we can certainly update it. We can certainly think about um, making it a FAR clause in the future. But to do that, we need feedback and support um, from your community uh, first. So uh, email this address, um, and then those questions will get funneled to us. Um, but we're also happy to take them in the room if anyone has any. Hello, hello? OK. Um, sort of what you just said, but um, most of my contracting officers or financial officers, first thing out of their mouth is, show me in the FAR where it says I have to do this. And right. we send them all the paperwork and everything. They say, so what? Where is it in the FAR? 
NARA a couple of years ago didn't have the FAR and the disposition schedules lined up. And for years, I fought with them on that. And, and that's pretty much their attitude now. Right, so we have the FAR to is not the only place where you uh, get this type of direction, right? The direction comes from a variety of sources. One of them is the Federal Records Act. One of them is A130, which is an OMB circular. So I would suggest that it's just, it's silly to think that the FAR is the only place where it tells you to do things. And that's... Just not, Most just of not. them feel that way. So <laughs> they, they you're them. asking me to run into a wall as hard as I can against somebody. And my, my poor <laughs> records manager is a GS6 dealing with a GS15. You know how that discussion is going to end. It's going up at headquarters with me. Well, so we're giving you a pillow here as you run into the wall. Because <laughs> this, this is set up as a term and condition. So it's right. something that is, this is what goes into the contract. So it does, it's not, we're not pointing to a FAR clause. But this is set up as a term and condition, so it's set up to plug into a contract. Um, it's, so it's easier to implement that way. It's set up to be easy to plug, it, plug mm -hmm. in your agency information and put it in the contract. So an easy way to get your training obligations and the, in turn, from the management or from the directive um, into your contract. So even though it's not in the FAR, we are interested in eventually getting there. But if before, we, before we fight that battle, we want to make sure that it's in a version and in a format that is working for people. Um, so that's why we really do ask for feedback as you start to implement these um, and roll it out into contracts. What is missing? What could be helped? Or what would help you um, with these contracts? Would anyone else like to run into any walls? <laughs> your purview, but I've never understood whether every single record created by a contractor for a contract really is a federal record, like a janitorial company's buying their supplies to, to clean the floors, all those receipts, those are federal records? Is there anywhere that, where that's explained? That's in part of the contract, but it's, a fed, but it's, it's just supply records, receipts, no. No, I mean, those are invoices, they might be support for a claim to have payment, but I wouldn't think of those as federal records. Was, the is, definition of record still applies. So I, we're not trying to redefine what a record is, just to highlight that there are records in the production and um, development of a contract and then in terms of the exercise of the contract. So this is not intended to change what, what is defined as a record or what's mm -hmm. considered a record by a contractor, um, just to highlight for the contractors and um, that they're there. There are records there, and they need to be aware of their obligations. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think our, in that like week between Christmas and New Year's, um, where like weird things happen and you don't really realize it, um, there was a FAR clause that was issued, like so December 2016. Um, there was a FAR clause that was issued about privacy training and it essentially says all contractors working on this contract need to take agency issued privacy training, right? So all I'm suggesting is that don't reinvent the wheel if your privacy office is already uh, making sure that they have the steps in place to comply with that FAR clause, right? Then you can just add records management to that process so that you, you're just getting one package. And our, our understanding is there'd likely be a lot of overlap between those contractor and contractor employees required mm -hmm. to take the privacy training and then those that you're, um, you're needing to take the records management training as well. Other questions? Right. As Hannah said, feel free to reach out. Um, we're happy to answer any questions, and we appreciate your time. Thanks. So before Gordon closes, I just wanted to say one quick thing. Um, I really appreciate the comment about ERA. I want to make this meeting a meeting for all of us. So as we close this one and we start thinking about the next ones, think about what topics you want to talk about. Um, think about what you want to hear us present on. And I really would love it if we could maybe do some joint things where we can get some agencies up here talking along with us about what's going on, you know, related to the directive or, or the annual move um, to try and make it a little bit more collaborative, maybe have some more discussion. So. Um, 
as you go back to your offices, um, you've got Bridge on your mind, um, send them to rmcommunications at nara.gov or to the mystery man that uh, you've been hearing throughout this meeting, Jim Stossel, who's our outreach specialist. Um, you can get in touch with, uh, with our program through Jim or through the general email box. But uh, you know, I think you know, we have an opportunity every, every other month to, to not only provide you with information that you really need to do your jobs, but I think it's also an opportunity which we really haven't leveraged very much in the past to, to hear what agencies are doing and have some discussion about that. So just a, a small plug for that and uh, just to remind everybody who Jim Stossel, our outreach specialist is, so when he pops up and you know, has a, a question from uh, the web that we're monitoring, you know exactly who it is that you're, you're hearing from. Um, so if you would, just keep that in mind, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll hear from you soon. And I will turn it back to Gordon for closing. OK. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, just a reminder for everyone, the appraisal teams uh, two and four will meet at one o'clock in the Washington room. Uh, appraisal teams two and four at one o'clock in the Washington room. Uh, are there any questions from, from, uh, for any of the presentations that we had today? We do have one in the middle. Somebody want to get them a mic? A website in the beginning? Uh, in which presentation? All right. Great. Just hit escape. Look, guys. There you go. All right. Right in here? That's not it. You're going to put it where? We'll put it out on the block. OK. Wait a minute. Is, is this the very last one that we just spoke about? Because you went through there so fast, I don't know where you are. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the very last one. OK, well, let me, let me just write that down. That'll do. OK. All right. And if not, they'll put it. Yeah, they'll have these slides out, and, it, and um, you can pick it up there if it's not. I had another question. Uh, yes, uh, again, uh, Tom from the Air Force. Uh, going back to Cindy uh, Smallvik's uh, presentation on the um, reportings, okay, um, there was um, still sort of really, yes, um, um, I just wish that uh, NARA did not include the uh, FOIA questions in the RMSA. Um, I still think that should just be set aside for the DOJ and report for FOIA, and that uh, we should not be seeing any additional uh, non-records management processes type questions in the annual report, like say from privacy or information collection or anything like that. Um, I realized that perhaps Darren was trying to emphasize that there should be a close tie in between FOIA and records management, but uh, putting it into the RMSA uh, to me, uh, personally I think it's a foul, but uh, that's just for the record. And um, um, also, I did notice that the RMSA had a lot of questions on metadata, which I presume was driven by the um, OMB Circular 8-130 revised um, document. Uh, so uh, that, uh, you know, that was something that I took note of. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay. You want to respond to that? Sure. Thanks, Tommy. You always, you always come through with some good questions. So. Um, <laughs> As you know, the RMSA, you know, a lot of times, you know, we, we want to collect information about other things that are going on in the records management environment. So the first thing to know about the FOIA questions is that they were unscored. So, and I think there were about eight questions. They're different than what DOJ would ask and from that perspective. So it, it's, it's focusing on records management connected to FOIA. And it's, and it's really just a means for us to collect information. And every year, you know, we have a focus area or an opportunity to reach all 260 agencies on a particular topic. And when we do that, like we do with FOIA, we don't score this question so they don't factor into your overall score. It's more for us to maybe investigate and learn a little bit more about a specific topic. And then we can then figure out what it means and what we might want to do with it, maybe in terms of developing guidance or doing assessments in agencies and so on. So uh, that's the explanation. 
Okay. If there are no other questions, we're going to adjourn, and uh, we'll see you in June. April, May. Yeah, in June. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>